You're on CY Interview. I'm Chris Shandek, featured columnist Jay Bilstein is with me. Today on CY Interview, we welcome back political journalist and political prognosticator Kristen Brown to talk about who will win the 2020 elections. It is the Sunday before the 2020 United States elections that will be taking place this coming Tuesday. Uh, here, Kristen will be back with his final analysis on who will win the elections. He just put it out this morning. Kristen, thanks so much for joining us on CY Interview. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Jay, for having me again today. Oh, we always enjoy your 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 sober and data analysis and, and open perspectives. They're always really great to have. So, you know, based on all of your data, um, you believe Joe Biden is going to win the presidency. But what I found really interesting in your final analysis is that, you know, looking at states like Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina, you pretty much say the, the Midwest, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, you believe, are going more towards Biden. But I'd really love for you to talk about Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina. And based on what you think, which one of these three states do you think is most likely to go to Biden? Again, Joe Biden doesn't need these states to win the presidency, but they no doubt help if something surprises in other areas. Well, I'm surprised to say that I really think at this point, based on what I'm seeing in the polling data, that of the three states you mentioned, I think North Carolina is likely to go to Biden. Uh, he has the uh, uh, biggest lead on average in that state, not much of a lead, around two points. Uh, but it looks like uh, from the trends and what I'm seeing that of those three, uh, North Carolina looks best for Biden. And in fact, I've characterized North Carolina as leans Democratic. I have characterized Florida and Arizona as tilts Democratic. So I have North Carolina one slight gradation uh, better for Biden than I do for Florida or Arizona. Oh, I agree with you 100%. I think North Carolina, you know, most likely uh, to go into that category. Of course, as you know, Obama won that the first go around when he became president the first time when he defeated John McCain. So, you know, looking forward on all of those kinds of things, how much did an early voting factor into analysis um, of your final conclusions? Obviously, you know, these unbelievable turnouts we're seeing in a lot of states that are not traditionally democratic, this must be an encouraging moment No, You know, I, the bigger the turnout, the better the chance Democrats win which is why, you know, it was tough for me to hold Texas at leans Republican um, because we've seen so much heavy early voting in Texas. I have to think that bodes well for Joe Biden. But still, if you look at the polling data in Texas, it's clear that Trump's ahead. Um, but I really think that early voting works to the Democrats' benefit, which is why you've seen so many attempts by Republicans to limit it in recent years. So then looking at the United States Senate races, you're really – thinking that this is going to be a breakdown of 50-50, and for the Democrats to have a more slight majority, um, you really think it's going to come down to the races in Iowa and in the two Senate races in Georgia. The question I really wonder for you is, let's say the Republicans end up winning in Iowa in the Senate race, and it comes down to those two Georgia races that obviously could probably most likely go to runoffs. Do you feel like that just that the Democratic voting bloc is going to see Joe Biden if he wins the presidency as, well, everything's taken care of now. Now I don't need to worry about these congressional elections, and that's why you have them slightly going to the Republicans um, if they go to the runoff. There is a tendency, unfortunately for Democrats, um, for their voters to not necessarily always show up in such robust numbers outside of the presidential election every four years. And historically, um, Democrats have suffered in recent years in Georgia whenever statewide races have gone to runoffs because of the drop-off in Democratic participation between the November election and the December runoff. And so I expect that both of these Georgia races for the U.S. Senate will go to runoffs. Um, and I think that ultimately plays to the benefit of the Republicans. Um, there would have to be a major change in how Democrats approach uh, an election uh, to to alter that calculus. You don't think very quickly, before I ask one last question and throw it to Jay, you don't think that the Democrats can, can recapture something close to what Stacey Abrams dealt with two years ago when she was running to be the governor of Georgia? I, I think that they are recapturing that, uh, but they really needed to get them over 50% on election night. Um, my best guess is that turnout will drop off considerably for the runoff, as it typically does. Um, 
and that just uh, is based on what has typically happened. Now, you know, if some of the new uh, people who have moved into Georgia, you know, are more committed and more willing to uh, go out and vote again a month later, but what I've often found is that when Democrats win an election, they go into hibernation for the next four years. Yeah, that's very true, based on past trends. Last question, uh, Democrats expanding their House lead um, over the Republicans. House of Representatives is still going to be Democratic majority. What do you think this means that the Democrats, you believe, will expand their, their seat number here? I mean, really what it does is it just gives them a bigger cushion for the midterm election. They can afford to lose a few more seats and still maybe hold the majority. Um, it really doesn't matter if you've got 230 or 240 or 250 House seats, because really in the House there's no filibuster. So as long as you have a majority, you can pass bills. So the, the key thing now is for Democrats to gain as many seats as they can so that in the midterms, when they are likely to lose seats, if in fact Biden wins the presidency, they can maybe hold on to their majority, even if they do suffer fairly significant losses. Jay? Uh, Cliston, great to be speaking with you today. Uh, you. I, have, I have to say that I am uh, I'm anxious to get the election over with. I'm anxious for the result, and I'm anxious to be able to close the chapter, a sad chapter, uh, in American history and hopefully have a presidency of uh, Joe Biden uh, beginning at 12 noon on January 20th, 2021. But let's, let's walk away from my desire, and I don't say that as a Democrat or Republican, I say it as an independent, and I say it as a person who looks for the best for the United States of America. How likely are we to see a victory by Joe Biden if, if there is suddenly huge momentum in rural Pennsylvania, and if for some reason he does not prevail in Pennsylvania, how tough is this race going to be? Well, they call Pennsylvania the Keystone State, and I believe that Pennsylvania is the Keystone State in this election. Um, in all of my analyses, one thing that I keep coming back to is you can take a state here or there away from Trump or Biden, and they can probably still win the election. But Pennsylvania, to me, is the one state that both of them have to have. If Joe Biden is losing Pennsylvania, he's probably losing the election. How concerned? I, I, I suspect you're concerned because this is really, you know, there are a lot of marbles at stake here, but do you think that it's possible realistically that the rural voters in Pennsylvania have been very unrepresented in the polls? You know, it was certainly possible four years ago. That's exactly what happened. We saw rural voters come out in Pennsylvania in waves that we had never seen before. What I will say is I find it difficult to imagine they're going to be able to surpass that. And they topped out. I mean, they barely won the state even with that uh, wave of rural voters. Uh, this time, I, I think what you're seeing is that the suburbs are moving much more heavily in favor of the Democrats. Hillary Clinton did not win the Philadelphia suburbs by the margins that she expected to. And that, in the end, was the difference in Pennsylvania. As I said on one of our uh, previous broadcasts together, um, typically the numbers that Hillary Clinton got in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh would be enough to win the state. And she was right there, uh, but she didn't win Bucks, Montgomery, and Chester counties by the margins that I think she expected to, and that ended up being the difference. I expect Biden is going to do significantly better in those three counties, and I do expect, based on all the data we've seen so far, uh, that Biden is pretty likely to win Pennsylvania and therefore the election. I uh, well, as I say, from your mouth to God's ears, I believe that I believe that too. Um, as a matter of fact, I went out on a limb back on what was it, Chris, on July tenth? Yeah. On July tenth, I believe seven seven o'clock Las Vegas time. I said to Chris, I'm 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 coming in with my prediction. I'm coming in with it early, and based on momentum, I said this election is going to Joe Biden. Joe Biden's going to be our next president. 
by all uh, indications in momentum that I saw back then, and I continue to believe that. But the thing that does make me somewhat nervous is, you know, what I will call the rural wild card in Pennsylvania. However, my analysis is much like yours. Uh, I, I believe that Joe Biden is showing significantly better with white suburban women, and I believe this holds true in Pennsylvania, would hold true in the suburbs of Philadelphia, uh, and in Philadelphia, and in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, and so he'll pick up there if everything else stays the same, and I can't really foresee the rural voters being more energized now than they were in 2016, uh, Biden takes the state. you agree with that breakdown? I completely agree with that breakdown, yes. Let's get beyond the election for a moment. Uh, Chris and I have had this discussion a, a multiplicity of times. I was very concerned when Donald Trump came down the escalator in, in Trump Tower in 2015 uh, eventually, I said to Chris, he's going to win, again, based on momentum. It was something that I thought was uh, a horrific possibility that a lot of people ignored. Uh, Chris, I said to you frequently, Donald Trump is a symptom of a sick society. Uh, and I believe that. I, I, I believe our, our society has been drawn in by a, a debased culture, and I'm not saying this in a prudish way or in a way that I don't like that fun or any such thing. But I think we became a, a, a culture of reality television and a bunch of, and, and, and a sick symbiosis of voyeurs and narcissists on a variety of social media platforms. And I think a lot of us has lost the plot about appearance and reality. Um, would you agree that the first step to getting the United States of America back on the right track is for the current administration to go, but would you also agree that we have monumental work in front of us? I completely agree on both of those points. I think that uh, when you're in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. If we yeah, first law of holes, indeed. Yeah, if we elect Joe Biden on Tuesday, we've at least – Stop digging, but we've got a lot of work to do. You are absolutely correct. As I've said for a long, long time, Donald Trump is not the disease. Donald Trump is the symptom. Donald Trump is the symptom. Uh, agree completely. And we now have here a lot is... of work to do. Go ahead. Go ahead. All I, was gonna, I was just going to say we have a lot of work to do. We have, we have, as you pointed out, this reality TV culture, but we also have this, this idea among the public that, you know, that people who have been in government can't be trusted. And, you know, I, I understand where that's coming from, but it leads us to elect unqualified people like Donald Trump, and uh, we put ourselves in a bad situation. You know, if I want to get my brakes fixed and I'm not happy with the job that my last mechanic did, I'm not going to take it to my hair stylist. I'm going to take it to another mechanic and see if I can find a better mechanic because, you know, Otherwise, you know, we're going to have catastrophic results, and that's what we've had. In, indeed, and I, I think that's a, a very apt analogy. Here is what my greatest concern is, and I'd love to hear you weigh in on this. Um, part of what I found so repugnant and what I find repugnant about the Trump administration is that he has currencyed very, very heavily in scapegoating and in the assignment of blame rather than coming to the nation, being a cheerleader for the nation, but saying that our way forward is a way of shared sacrifice, and that sacrifice is going to have to be shared to greater or lesser extents by all of us. But instead, his preference, as is often the preference of demagogues, was to point a finger at individuals who really have nothing to do with the current state of the United States of America. Uh, on, on the contrary, his striking at immigrants, uh, uh, perhaps the fact that people still want to come to the United States is actually a very positive thing and may be mm -hmm. one of the points of our salvation. That being said, there are people on, 
And, and I really hate the whole left-right game, red-blue game, but I'm going to be forced into this Norman, uh, nomenclature for the sake of convenience. There are people on the extreme left who will, you know, talk about universal basic income. They will talk about forgiving all uh, student loans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I look at where we are. I haven't looked at the debt clock recently, but I, I, I have to believe where, you know, Chris, when's the last time you looked at the debt clock? Are we past $25 trillion now? Are we at $28 trillion? Where are we exactly? I think we're at $27 trillion, but I'll double-check as you're speaking. Yeah, please. I think we're heading to $28 trillion. You know, Kristen, I remember something called the, uh, what was it, the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, which was referred to as Simpson Bowles, which came in as a, a presidential commission on, debt, uh, on deficit reduction, under Barack Obama, and uh, it was comprised of uh, um, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles. And this was a bipartisan commission. They came out with, a, in my mind, a whole bunch of serious, somber, and sober recommendations for getting our financial house in order. And I think like most good things like this, they kind of uh, you know, irritated people on both sides. But are we going to be able to stop the absolutely calamitous track we're on? Uh, I don't hear anybody talking about shoring up Social Security. I don't hear anybody talking about shoring up Medicare. Both of those funds run out this decade, one sooner than the other. How on earth are we going to deal with that if people are looking to, to create yet more programs? We can't even finance the programs we've currently got. I mean, Jay, we can finance the programs we've got if we make the right decisions. I mean, there's a cap on Social Security where anything, any income over $118,500 a year no longer pays taxes into Social Security. If you got rid of that cap, you could make that program solvent for perpetuity. So that would be a very, very easy fix. And it wouldn't be much skin off of the nose of uh, people who might have a little more in taxes to pay after 118.5. So we certainly can do these things if we make the right decisions. Uh, I think that we've got to think of first things first. There is this tendency, uh, especially among the progressive left, to want everything at once. They, they were upset with Barack Obama because he didn't, you know, come through with everything they wanted in the first year or two of his administration. But the thing is, in politics, things take time, and you've got to be patient, and you've got to work, and you've got to, you've got to make incremental progress. I think that keeping our promises to the most vulnerable people in our society, seniors and, and people who uh, need health care, are paramount, absolutely paramount. And we've got to show up Social Security and Medicare before we do anything else. So, so let me ask you this. I'm going to give you a list, and you're going to say if, if you agree with my point. So agree 100% on Social Security. I, I probably would be in favor of, I'm sure you remember, uh, it was Al Gore originally who spoke about a, a donut hole on Social yep. Security. I think that's the first place I heard it where uh, you, you take a break, right, wherever Social Security stops there'd be a couple hundred thousand dollar gap and then it would it would turn on again at a certain level i think i'm not sure that joe biden has talked about that um, that and probably realistically rolling back a bit the age at which people can get social security that was done i believe in 1983 during the reagan administration the the top age was uh, 65 now at that time, it was turned to 67. Of course, people can elect to take Social Security later to get even more. Uh, I think a combination might work, but I agree 100%. Fix Social Security. Number two, absolutely necessary. Fix Medicare. Number three, make sure that Medicaid continues. Yeah. Now, we must fix the Affordable Care Act. We mm -hmm. must. I believe we must expand it, and I believe at the very least there has to be a public option so that people who are, you know, I don't know, you're, you're, a, you're a cab driver making $50,000 a year in New York City. Well, you can't qualify for Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act may still leave you with maybe no money. So... 
Sure. I think for folks like that, there should be a public option. If we did all the things that I'm talking about right now, do you really believe there's space for much more if we are to be fiscally responsible and also curtail the deficit? I really don't think that there would be room for a lot more beyond those things at this particular point in time. Uh, these are all things that I think would have to be worked in gradually, if at all. Um, one thing that I do not uh, support is the notion of uh, forgiveness of student loan debt. I do understand that college is a lot more expensive now than it used to be, but I also the issue there is that it is a benefit for only a minority of the population. Roughly only a third of U.S. adults have bachelor's degrees. Therefore, roughly only a third or so of Americans might have the possibility of having that kind of issue. And it's going to be looked upon by the overwhelming majority of the population as a benefit for privileged people. And I think that's a political loser for us. I, I, and, you know, you come out politically, I come at from a point of view of moral hazard. What happens to all the kids who came out of high school mm -hmm. and they either said, gee, I'm not really a, a study type of person, I'm a learn-on-the-job yeah. person, or the person who said, gee, you know, I'll go to a community college and then I'll go to a, you know, a state school or something and, and I'm not going to make mm -hmm. the same elite contacts. But what, what about the people who come out and they say, you know, I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to borrow money and I'm going to get my family to co-sign a loan so I can start a, uh, you, you know, one of these companies that ha comes to your home and helps clean out drains when things get mm -hmm. stuffed up. Somebody can make a real nice living doing that, but you need money to buy into that. Or there are in different cities, you know, where are these routes where you deliver uh, bread or meats or whatever the thing is, but you got to buy in, you got to own the route, and then you make your deliveries every day with truck and so forth. What about all the people who borrowed money to do that stuff? They're out there, yeah. they're contributing to the economy, they don't deserve relief. That's a fair point, that's an excellent point, and one of the things that I've been saying for a long time is that we have some really messed up paradigms in this country that we really need to fix. There is a tendency, particularly on the Democratic side, I hate to say that, as a Democrat, I hate to say this, but the Democratic Party, to some degree, has been stuck into this elitist notion that everybody ought to go to college, and that if you don't go to college, you're less successful, not very smart. And that's completely wrong. That is completely wrong. There are all kinds of ways that a person can make a living in this country, and most people are not going down that, that college track. And I think that we do the bulk of the country a great disservice, but I think it's also really a form of snobbery that gets us in trouble with a lot of, uh, you know, everyday people in the Midwest where I grew up. And I think we really need to shift our paradigm and, and think very hard about once again becoming a party of the working man and woman in this country. And I, I see so much of this elitism that has infected the Democratic Party, and we really got to do something about that. So let, let's let's run down the track. You know, let's run down the checklist because again, I'm an independent. You're a Democrat, uh, Chris. I believe you're an independent, and Chris has informed me that debt amazingly stands at twenty trillion, twenty-seven trillion dollars. I'm going to guess right now and say that in 2010, during Simpson Bowles, the debt was probably at fifteen trillion dollars. Yeah, something. I, I mean, this this this. Right. Yeah, this can't continue unless we really just court complete financial meltdown. So here, here's what I'm saying. One, we absolutely must comprehensively fix Social Security, period, and, and without cutting back money people get. That's number one. Yep. Number two, we must fix Medicare. We must make sure that there's sufficient money there for Medicaid, and we absolutely must fix and reasonably expand the Affordable Care Act so that you don't have people who are caught out. And I would like a public uh, option for people specifically at certain income levels. Perhaps it will be where they can pay into Medicare, et cetera, and, and make the gradations of what you have to pay more finely tuned to the money people have. And then the last thing I would concentrate, in, uh, concentrate on is deficit reduction, which we had during his successful eight years of the Clintons. Mm -hmm. And I think we would be doing 
quite well and we could court prosperity and evolve politically in what we do for the country over the next 10, 20 years. But my fear is that we are going to, and, and Donald Trump absolutely must be voted out of office, but what I fear is that the radicals on the left will begin scapegoating anybody with five cents in their pocket and claim that anybody who's been successful in the United States is their evil people, not unlike Trump has castigated you know, and pointed the finger to uh, immigrants or Muslim people or what have you. And then we'll kind of swing in a different direction. And I think we've got to step away from the politics of demonization, step away from scapegoating, be realistic mm -hmm. adults, all tighten our belt a little bit, and fix these specific things. Where are you on this? Jay, I see the progressive left and the Trumpian right as two sides of the same counterfeit coin. Me they too. Me too. They approach... Uh, they approach politics in the same way through demonization and pitting people against each other. And I, I am truly bothered by both. That's why I could never get behind Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. And that's why I consider Me myself to be a Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy Democrat. Agree a hundred percent. You know what? I, I if, if I guess you're proving I guess I'll have to relook at things because I, I it used to look at myself in that vein, and what you know, what's the term? The Democrat. I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris. Um, so, so in closing, Clifton, just to review, um, you know, if in your final results, what besides aside from Pennsylvania, you know, do you think that we're going to? Uh, see, what do you think about Florida? Is the one that also people are talking about at this point? I mean, Florida, to me, Florida and Georgia are the two true coin flip states of this election. Um, I, I would have to be supremely arrogant or deluded to tell you that I know what's going to happen in either of them. I am characterizing both as tilt democratic, but that's as much of a hunch as anything else, and it wouldn't be any great surprise for either of them to go the other way. Uh, I think that what you've got to look at on election night Florida, reputedly, is one of those states that counts its mail-in ballots and early votes pretty quickly. So we might be able to tell a lot about how the election is going to turn out, even if we don't have complete results in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, from how things go in Florida. Um, I will say this. Biden doesn't need Florida or Georgia to win. It makes his yep. path tougher, but he can win without them. If Florida or Georgia go to Biden, Trump's finished. Oh, I 100% agree with that. Chris, I, I, I want to stick this in. Um, you know, Cl Cliston uh, uh, very uh, uh, accurately pinpointed, you know, Pennsylvania's must win. I'd also say Nevada is must win, though. Um, I wouldn't say that. For one thing, it has so few electoral votes, it's not likely to be the tipping point state. I will also say this, though. I, I, I follow very closely the superb political analyst and data cruncher, John Ralston, who knows Nevada, yeah, John Ralston, better, sure. than, who knows Nevada better than probably any political analyst knows his own state. The guy's phenomenal. He picked Harry Reid back when everybody said Harry Reid was sure to lose, including me. Uh, and this guy, he's been tweeting the last few days about the, uh, the uh, early votes and the uh, mail-in uh, mail and absentee votes in Nevada. And he is pretty convinced that it appears that Biden is very likely to win Nevada based on the firewall that Democrats have built in Clark County. Uh, I, I, hope, I hope so specifically because, you know, in some simulations I've run, I've looked at how Maine could break, and, and you know, um, I feel that by having Nevada, you make up for what would it be an electoral vote that's lost in in Maine? Sure, sure. I mean, if if the election is that close, then then Nevada is pivotal. Certainly, I, I'm not sure it's going to be that close. But if it comes down to somebody has 267 electoral votes, then Nevada could make the difference. By, by the way, by the way, Clifton, something that I we've discussed this last time. I believe that Trump is not going away. I believe he's going to 
start some kind of media platform and, you know, he'll have whatever number it is, 10 million people who are paying him or his organization 10 or $12 a, a month and he's going to, you know, his, he's going to have this platform. And he certainly needs the money based on what I read, if it's true about the debt he faces and all and certain challenges he faces. Um, but with that being said, do you expect him, if there is a clear and convincing victory by Joe Biden, do you suspect that he will raise a fuss, or do you think he'll only do that if it's razor close? I, I expect that Donald Trump will raise a fuss regardless of what happens, regardless of how wide the margin may be, whether he believes it or not. You know, it's well documented that in the last few weeks before the 2016 election, Jared Kushner was in negotiations to begin a uh, media company. Um, I've always felt that Trump's real plan all along was to use running for president as a, as a means of building a base for his new media venture. And Me too. Agree 100%. He ended up winning the election, which nobody, including probably Donald Trump himself, truth be told, expected to happen. I expect that regardless of what happens on election night or in the weeks following the election, Donald Trump is going to keep saying he was robbed, keep ginning up his base, and the, for him, the worst thing that comes out of it, or the least that comes out of it, is he has a ready-made built-in base for his new media venture, which it appears he was attempting to get off the ground four years ago. And, and this will be people who fall into a sphere, who to some degree gravitate to Fox and to another degree gravitate to someone like Alex Jones? Would you say that's the demographic? I would say that is exactly the demographic. He is looking for, um, to be perfectly blunt, a group of very gullible people who are willing to buy what he's trying to sell. Do you think that will have a particularly deleterious effect on the country at large, or do you think he's just going to tap into a group that exists and just be taking some money away from the aforementioned platforms? I think that it's just going to keep shifting the Overton window uh, into the uh, crazy uh, realm. I think that uh, he will end up taking away quite a bit of the uh, base of something like Fox News. And uh, the, the, the effect is going to be that we just get further and further away from the mainstream and further and further away from reality. I understood. One thing that I think certain people may not be aware of, I, I, I think, I'm not sure. Um, well, I, I don't believe he is currently, but Jared, uh, Jared Kushner was an owner of the New York Observer, which is a newspaper out of New York City, uh, I, I believe a weekly paper, or at least it was. Um, and then uh, he was there, and I, I, I think they brought it back to a daily. It became online over or something like that. But Jared Kushner, Kushner was in the media business. And right. okay. I would argue that Trump's... I used to write for it. That's right. That's it. Did you ever interact with him or never? Never. Uh, I was approached in uh, 2015 by the editor of The Observer who contacted me and asked me if I would like to write for that publication. I knew nothing at the time about The Observer. I had no idea that Jared Kushner owned it, uh, but he came to me and gave me an opportunity to, uh, to uh, write on political matters, uh, on analysis, and uh, I took that opportunity. I never at any time had any interaction whatsoever with Jared Kushner, uh, never knew him, uh, never talked with him, never so much as got an email from him. I, I want to say that he probably bought that paper about 10 years before you got there. Um, one, of, one of the things is, you know, so you've got, he's Trump's son-in-law. He was in the media business. And then I'd argue that probably Trump's greatest success came in the media by way of The Apprentice and Celebrity Apprentice. I think pound for pound, he did far better as a, whatever you want to call him, an, an actor, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, he did better as a TV actor than he did as a real estate person. I mean, above all things, Trump is the crafter of an image. Donald Trump has been creating this image of Donald Trump for 40 years, uh, of a successful businessman, which clearly he really isn't, 
and um, and he just has been he has been so able to manipulate mass media to his benefit. Uh, he is the P.T. Barnum of our day. He has done a brilliant job in terms of manipulating the media, and that's what he's made an entire career out of. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree. Uh, he's, uh, he, he created a pastiche of the successful business person. Um, it, it, it would be nice if he would lose and go away. I don't think we'll get that. For now, I'll just settle for he'll lose, and if he starts his media platform, I hope there'll be enough voices that he doesn't expand the base of people who want to deal in uh, a lack of logic, reason, and facts, but uh, as you said uh, so well before, one step at a time. Chris? Uh, you can find the link to the final analysis for the 2020 elections in this post here on CUI interview from Clifton Brown. So for political journalist and political prognosticator Clifton Brown, featured columnist Jay Bilstein in CUI interview, I'm Christian Nicole.